Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, 19 through 25. Please like and share. I want you to like and to share this feed. If you're on Facebook Live, uh, use your Facebook page to spread this message. It needs to go around the world. Genesis 2, verse 18, 19 through verse 25. And the word of the Lord reads like this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper, helper suitable for him. And so the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took out of his rib, out of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, <laughs> This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman or man with womb because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, for this reason a man shall therefore leave his father and his mother and join to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Look at verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were both naked and not ashamed. I need to share a, a little bit about the home, a message entitled The Home, Foundation of the Glory of the Kingdom. The Home, a Foundation of the Glory of the Kingdom. And right now we have turmoil in America and there are some roles that have been forgotten and the nuclear family is being challenged. We need a word from the Lord about how to fix our families. Father, I thank you for this moment for thinking through me, thinking through my mind and speaking through these lips of clay as an oracle. But where there's no vision where there's no unfolding revelation or revelator, where there's no oracle, the people cast off restraint. So use me for your glory. Awaken a sense of need to restructure, to redefine, to retool our families. Let the home become the beacon of your glory. We will give you praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. The home, the foundation of the glory of the kingdom. First and foremost, a family is always there for your support and for your security. God has established family for your support, your personal support, the family support, supporting each other and for security. One of the things every predator does is try to divide and conquer. That type mentality, whether it's in government or it's in, in the wild, is not godly. It's a strategy of enemies to divide and to conquer. The love and understanding of a family displays is essential, is extremely necessary. The love that a father would share with his wife or wife for the, for the husband, uh, for the children, their affection toward their parent and parents for the children, these displays, these love displays are necessary. Just like other basic requirements, whether you're on a job or you're starting a business, a human being has also, has, uh, has also come to some emotional needs. 
come to know that we have emotional needs as well. We have requirements, father should work, and provide for his family. Right now in America, women are doing the same thing. That's a requirement if you wanna have a healthy house. But at the same time, there are some other emotional needs that need to be met. For the physical and the mental balance of every person in the family. If children are hungry, they're not gonna focus in school. And if we're looking on the outside of our family tree uh, for wellness, for support, that means there's a deficit within the walls of the home. Family, require, family provides us the, the uh, required affection. In a healthy family, it provides for us the required affection and understanding and the feeling of love, belonging, and support. If the family is loving, we're gonna have a sense of love. We need to feel it. And we also need to get a sense or have experience a sense of belonging and support. Another great importance of family is that our family protects us from all kinds of external influences. You have a strong family, it protects you, and you're full in your family. It will protect you from other external influences. Advertisers are going by homes today trying to draw out people within the home so they can spend their money in other places. It's the same thing that's going on emotionally. Kids aren't tied to their people. They're tied to other people. They're tied to other societies. The rebellion that we're experiencing in home right now is all tied to external influences. We must give attention to this. I think I share with the whole coronavirus pandemic is that God is allowing us to see other viruses that have already been in the midst of us. They've always been there. But the corona, our restricted movements, has caused us to focus on other things that have always been there. They've just been dormant. But now they're surfacing. And these external and internal influences are very, very grave. We need to do what we need to do to guard ourselves from the viruses that are attacking families today. In time, the traditional structure of family has shifted and changed. Now it includes divorcees, unwed mothers, single parents, especially in America, is, is big time. Teenage pregnancies are on the rise and same-sex marriages are on the rise. There's even an increase in adoption right now. That's what's happening, you need to know that. What does that have to do with Genesis chapter two? Well, you can see the original intent of what God was saying. God says, it is not good for man to be alone. And I'm saying it as well, it is not good for you to be single all of your life. Especially men, because men can do more damage to themselves than any woman or even the devil. We do more to, to hurt ourselves, to hinder ourselves, to slice ourselves than any devil could do. God says it is not good for a man to be alone. God says it is not good for a man to be alone. God says it is not good. I need to make him a helper that's suitable for him. Man is intellectual. He gave names to every beast, cattle, birds, and that fly in the sky. But there was no helper for him, which simply means if the man can't find a helper, he'll look to the wild for it. Let me say it again. If the man can't find a helper, he will look to the wild for comfort. He knows them into every beast he knows. His nature connects with the beast. 
This is why it's important for the man to buckle down and say, I need to follow what God is saying for my life. I can't stay single forever. So God made him a helper and he created a family. Out of the man comes the woman and out of the woman comes the family and out of the family comes the society. If the society is messed up, we need to go back to the family and then back to the woman and then ultimately back to the man. Can't point at kids and just say, look how bad they are. We got to go all the way back. We have a fallen nature that needs to be corrected by the blood of Jesus. And if the home is to be the, the bedrock for the glory, we need to check its foundation. So what is the meaning of a traditional family? What is the meaning of a traditional family? We don't hear those terms anymore. Husband, wives, and children. A traditional family will involve two married people traditional family of opposite sex who provide stability and care for their biological children. That's the traditional definition of family. It is called today the nuclear family. That's being attacked by agencies. It's being attacked by movements. I love Black lives matter because black lives do matter. But when you read the manifesto, they want to attack the nuclear. That's why some of you that are marching and those of you that are going just before you march and before you put on a shirt, why don't you go to the website? You may be blown away when you see the movement that it's causing or the hijack that's taking place right up under our nose. They want to destroy and to dismantle the nuclear. We don't need men. When God says it is not good for man to be alone. Where is he to go if you don't need men? What is he supposed to do? Go to the wild? And if he don't have a woman, he will go to the wild. In about 30 years, you're going to be really crying, asking God for the family back, the traditional family back. Because if a man don't have anybody to calm that nature, especially God and then a woman, he's going to the wild. Hanging out every weekend, getting into trouble, doing crazy things because it's not good for man to be alone. I know my message may intimidate or actually cause some people to get disturbed. But you don't know now. <laughs> In time, the traditional structure of the family has shifted. It's changed. And people want to get rid of that. But we need to keep moving. Let's talk about uh, essential components in a physical foundation. Because the family should be built on a solid foundation. In the natural, you have to have concrete. Don't trust a house that doesn't have concrete, concrete in the foundation. You also need rebarb or metal in the foundation. And you need, sometimes uh, people do concrete block as the, the, the foundation or put that in the foundation. Those three elements are essential. We're not talking about mechanical yet. We're not talking about electrical. And we're not talking about plumbing. This is just strictly foundation. And if you just check out what is the foundation of your life. You can have foundation if, even if you're in a single parent household. I was watching a video, uh, a, uh, a video expression the other day where these powerful athletes are giving praise to their mother. Like LeBron James, who was raised by a single mother. And he was like, I don't know how you did it, mama. I don't know how. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you raised us. With no help. But you're my champion. So God can work through single parent households if mothers are dedicated. And he's been doing it. We're not desecrating that. What we're talking about 
is foundation for everyone that succeeds. There's a hundred that's trying, but they're struggling because the nuclear family is broken. We need concrete. You need concrete principles. You need metal. You need structure in the foundation. You need concrete blocks. Where are yours? What are your thoughts of God? What are your thoughts of his word? What are your thoughts about kids? What are your thoughts about teaching? What are your thoughts about value? Ethos, pathos, and logos. The word, the feelings, and the ethics. In the scripture, the Lord is always, uh, always using as a figure uh, a house that's built on a rock. He describes that when he talks about building your life out of Matthew chapter 7. You can find it around verse 24. You don't have to go there, write it down. He that heareth these sins of mine and do them, I will liken him unto a wise man that builds on a foundation, a rock. If the winds come, if the floods come, if viruses come and beat on that house, it stands because the foundation is sure. Concrete, metal, concrete block. And don't play with your foundation. Notice even in education, they lay a proper foundation with mathematics. Um, that's um, simple mathematics like addition and subtraction and uh, division and multiplication, right? Come on, Dr. Uh, Joseph, you can help me. Science, English, these are the basics. This is laying the foundation for your growth and development intellectually, educationally. You can't go to PhD status and you don't know how to write. Nobody would trust you. Nobody would trust what you're saying if you, you still Ebonics and, you know, I ain't got no nothing and talking about you're a doctor. Nobody's listening to that. Triple negatives must go. We must speak the king's English if we're going to be effective. And your Christian life must be built and laid upon the foundation of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation. Ha. other than the one which is laid which is Jesus Christ so you don't have to go out there and try to find the concrete and try to find the rebarb and try to find the concrete block the foundation which has it all in Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ for no man can lay a foundation other than the one that is laid so before you just talk about I got to send all of my children to college and I got to work on, I got to take care of my family. Where is the foundation? Don't build the walls without the foundation. Don't put in plumbing without the foundation. Don't put fire in the walls. Don't have any electricity coming to any building. You don't need no Holy Ghost if you don't have foundation. There's a lot of believers love the move of the spirit, but where are your feet? Where are you planted? Ooh, I just love, I love the way the Holy Ghost moves. But where are your feet? As soon as the wind blows, as soon as there's a storm, or as soon as we can't gather together, many walk away from the faith. But when your foundation comes, hallelujah, when it is sure, the foundation of God stands sure, the Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ, foundation, let him depart from iniquity. Isaiah 28 and 16, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation. A costly, it is, it is valuable. This is not a throwback stone. This is a valuable, it is the chief cornerstone, the cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed, the scripture says. There's no movement there. There's no variance in this. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. You build this one, a whole lot of hell that we're dealing with in our homes. Uh, uh, we won't have to because we're making sure everybody is building on the same foundation. 
That means children must be connected to it. Wives must be connected to it. Husbands must be connected to it. Not just the children and the wife and the husband do, does whatever or the husband and the children do whatever. Everybody needs to be on the same rock. We'll cut off 90% of our hell or issues that's going around, on around the world if all of us were standing on the same foundation. Romans chapter 15 verse 20 and thus I aspire to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named so that I could not build on another man's foundation. And this should be the desire of every leader is to just uh, develop a church that has an appetite for the loss. To make sure that we pull people who never knew about Jesus and we're not trying to build or capitalize on other foundations. But we want to make sure that we're pulling them out of the world and let them be built on one foundation. And it, that is the Lord Jesus Christ in him crucified. Here's another one. First Timothy chapter three, verse 14 and verse 15. I am writing these things to you. Hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed. If I can't see your face. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Which is the church of the living God. Look at that. The pillar and support of the truth. And here Paul to his son Timothy is saying, not only should you look at the foundation, but from it we got pillars. Make sure the pillars are connected with the foundation. But from the, pillar, from the uh, foundation, we can erect pillars to then hold up a structure. And you see a house being formed. I write to you, I can't get to you. There's a barrier between us. There's an ocean between us. There is a, a virus between us. There's a, well, we must have, have distancing here. But at the same time, we can build on the same foundation. It is our faith that makes us well. And then in Matthew chapter 7, I think I came to you a little earlier, verse 24. Therefore, anyone who heareth these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods, the rains of adversity fell, the floods of yesterday's past, the winds of controversy and gossip blew and slammed against the house and yet it did not fall where it had been it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand scripture says the same issues attack that house life happened but it failed and great was its fall. What is the definition of the glory of God? If we want the home to be the foundation of the glory of God in the kingdom of God. So what is the definition of glory? James 1, 9 through 11 says, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. The humble circumstances here, according to James, is a high position, not being born in the lap of luxury. Look at how you got to shift your mind when you follow God. But the brother of humble circumstances is the glory in his high position. God says when you come up and you got to struggle a little bit, that's a high position. Because you got to grow into riches and grow into wealth and grow into sustenance. If you get it without working for it, you'll squander it. America has got a whole generation. Pass me down millions. Pass me down billions. And everybody's sitting back. And as soon as a virus comes, oh, I want my liberty. I got to have my liberty. Let me tell you something. You haven't gone through any struggle for it. Most of us know what it's like to go through some wind and some rain and some floods. And all we're doing is just coasting right along. That's our love boat. We're always tossed and we're always thrown. But God is always sustaining his people. 
I need a few people that know how to get in a boat that's rocking and they can stay on the boat. Already know what it's like to have bologna and cheese and already know what it's like to have spam and eggs. I already know what it's like to use your grandmama's recipe and make it all work together and still be full, still moving forward. I'm not less than. It's a humble beginning, but God is moving in it. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Look at the next verse here, verse 10. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because like flowers, grass, he will pass away. <laughs> James is saying this is a matured man now. He's not just the little brother of Jesus that just, you know, didn't really know. This is the half brother of Jesus. You know that, right? He, he didn't really see Jesus as Lord until after his resurrection. Ah, I know he's in Nazareth. I know he's in Capernaum. I hear all of that. Ah. But after his resurrection, uh, historians say Jesus appeared to James. And when he did, it shook him. He appeared to him and he magnified himself in the midst of his brother. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his knees and he stayed there for years. He wouldn't get up. He stayed on his knees until they became like camel's knees and became flat. And he crippled himself. So James walked around like this. When he says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, you need to know he has a scar on his knees. Yeah. It's not just word talk. He built the proper foundation. Yes, glory to God. A lot of people can talk it, but they're not walking it. If you want glory to come from your life, you've got to bow knee. You've got to be, you've got to be single-minded. You've got to be the kind of one that asks for wisdom and God gives it. You've got to be the one that resists the proud and move away from pride but God gives grace to the humble. You've got to be the one that lets the sin go and embraces the righteousness. I don't know what's happening to me. I feel good looking at your face. I know God is with us. I know God is bringing us out. I know God is taking us to another level. I know God is doing something in us. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Give God a praise right there. He's worthy of our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Let the rich man glory in his humiliation because all of that is going to fade. And I just hope America is not just seeing your future in the lenses of a stock market or a retirement fund. We need to get to something that's deeper. Obviously, America is not reading James chapter 1. Africa and around the world, God says when you have humble beginnings, you should give God the glory. Because when he adds to you, if God is for you, who can be against you? When you got a lot of riches, you say, I got a lot of money and the money is for me. So who can be against me? But you need to understand that you need God with you. You can have a whole lot and still not have God. I need to describe glory. I need to describe glory. The glory of God is the invisible qualities of God. It is the invisible felt qualities of God. It is the invisible character of God. The invisible attributes of God. The qualities of God. But they are felt. The Greek is. The Greek is kabod. The kabod. Or the weight of God. So glory is thick. And it's heavy. And a lot of times when you feel heavy. It's not sadness that you should allow. The enemy to tell you you're sad. Sometimes God allows his glory to rest on you. When you're going through your hardest time. And you'll feel weighted. Hallelujah. And there should be some weight in the family. The more glory we have, the less we are bypass words or when the wind blows, we fly away. If a man has glory on his life, he doesn't quit because there's an issue. 
When a woman has glory on her life, she'll stick with it. Even if there's pain, she'll stick with it until God brings her out. And when a home has glory on it, you won't see it blow down when the, when the big bad wolf huffs and puffs and blows and blows against it. You won't see it fall down because it's great. It stands on a rock and the glory makes it heavy and the wind cannot blow it away. That's why I ask God to allow my words to weigh 10 pounds. Put glory on what I say. When they hear it, let glory rest on it where they can't shake it. That means we don't have to have many words, but our words need to be weighted down. They need to be replete with the glory of God. Hallelujah. So glory is the invisible qualities, character, and attributes of God. Displayed in a visible or knowledgeable way. They're invisible, but they're displayed in a visible or knowledge of way. Shekinah can be seen. The Shekinah glory. And it showed up a lot in the Old Testament. After the Holy Spirit came, he said, you don't need to see thick Shekinah because I'm the Shekinah. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to tell you that you're my own. Beautiful song in worship today. He knows my name. And if God knows your, my name, you don't just need to see Shekinah. He's in you. That's why you see Shekinah showing up in the Old Testament a lot. There are people who want to see it in every service, but the glory is inside of you. There is a glory that excels that glory that even Moses experienced. Moses came out of the presence of God Face shine. When he walked out of the presence of God coming down the mountain, I want you to see this. A glow is on him. He's walking down the mountain. It's dark out there. And people see, what is that? And as he got close to them, they started screaming because his face was shining like the sun. Physically. Read it in the text. His face is shining. The Bible says he put a veil over his face so they wouldn't be afraid of him. Put a mask on. And he had to talk to them this way. And the Bible says, even in reading the Old Testament, that veil is still on people's hearts. So if you want to go back to the Old Testament to see glory, you're going to miss that. Because in Christ, the veil is taken away. And there is a glory in Jesus that excels the glory of Moses. Because it's all external. Now the glory is on the end. If you can just tap into it, you get some strength right now. If you can tap into the glory, you won't blow away. If you can tap in the glory, the floods won't stop you from moving. If you can tap in the glory, the rains, though it's falling, you'll still stand. Hallelujah. Because you're founded on the rock. Don't let COVID take away your amen. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. The glory of God is the beauty of his spirit. <laughs> we know the spirit is invisible, but his glory is the beauty. The attraction that's on his spirit. It's not artistic. It's not visible beauty. Or material beauty, because many of us go after those things. But it is the beauty that emanates from his character, from his heart, from his practices, from all that he is. Just like the anointing is the manifested presence of God, the glory is the beauty of his spirit. And I need more glory. We like the power of God, but God wants to give you some beauty. He wants to give you the beauty of his spirit. Hallelujah. What are the roles of a family? Why is that important? Well, if glory is to come back, we need to understand roles. When we start looking at what a mother does, what a father traditionally does, what an uncle or auntee is supposed to do, grandfather and grandparents, 
In the kingdom, you don't have all of those things. You have fathers, mothers, and children. You don't have uncles and, and great granddaddies and all of that in the spirit. But we can look at our family trees to understand the structure and the roles that should be played. Roles help to, to assign identity. When you don't have roles, your identity becomes skewered. And that's why a lot of times we have, when we're raising kids, we got to lay down roles. You can't just say, all oh, y'all sit down and shut up. No, you got to train them up in the way they should go. That when they're old, they will not depart. What are the role of that boy? You can't say your role is the same as your sister because you will see something shift. We need to make sure that we have traditional roles that's played according to the word. We're not just talking about tradition, but according to the word. In the Jewish family, and I know many of us are not Jews, but in the Jewish family, at the age of 12, the boy is surrendered to the father, not for nurturing, but to train up so you can take over the family business. Why is that necessary at 12? Because mothers will continue to nurture and continue to nurture and continue to nurture and continue to nurture. At 18, continue to nurture and continue to nurture. Say, that's the love, but I love mine. I lo okay, but you continue to nurture and you never transfer over. And they grow up underdeveloped and over nurtured. That's why when the first time the girlfriend says something the wrong way like mama never did, they want to smack her. Don't you ever disrespect me. It's wrong, but you got to look at the roles. And girls are not boys even at four. I don't care if they like a football. You are not a boy. You're made totally different. We're going to give you some special treatment, and you need to have some private time. You're not riding on no, you're not going to ride on no uh, uh, rodeo and ride opening or a motorcycle all spread out. We need to make sure that you understand your roles. We're not saying you can't, you have to be limited in your thoughts, but there's some things we're not going to do with our little girls. Now this one, I got the amen on the inside of me. This may be totally contrary to what you believe, but I believe the report of the Lord. <laughs> and his report says structure is good. These titles carry responsibility. Not daddy means something. Mama means something. Mother means something. Physically and spiritually. So you got the nuclear family. Then you also have childless families. You have parents who never ever had children at all. That's big right now. We have spiritual fathers and mothers that haven't been able to produce. Let me just shift and pray for you, God, and pronounce something. God, it, the Bible says in Isaiah 54, sing, barren. You who could not bear, break forth in the singing and cry aloud. More of the children of the desolate than of the married wife. And if you don't see physical, God is trying to burst something spiritual out of you. What you do is say, because there's no physical baby, I'm childless, you give up. But you need to read Isaiah 54. Then we have single parent families. In America, in the African American community, almost 70% of the family is in this category. And it's severe. So mother's playing both roles. She's trying to be right-handed and left-handed at the same time. Right-handed and left She had to be strong, and then she's got to be a nurturer. And it's hard to make these shifts. And I'm praying for you as well. That God will give you strength. Watch this. But a unique beauty, glory, and balance. To where you don't have to shout a lot, but your words weigh 10 pounds. Then we have, I don't like this term, but it's, you need to see it. Step families. I don't like the term, but it's real. That is the mixture a man comes into a relationship with extra kids. The wife comes in to a relationship with extra kids. And you need some training and teaching on how to do that. We're mixing the families. 
but we don't have the tools. I, think I can preach a long time on that one. Then we have what we call the extended family. That's your grandma and your uncles and all of these other people. Most people don't know where that ends, where, where grandfather and grandmama ends and where your family begins. We got men that are still submitted to their mom and they're married. And the mom tried to tell them what to do in the marriage. They didn't understand leaving and cleaving and weaving your resources. <laughs> That's a painful thing to, to leave, cleave, and weave your resources together. But if you do, you'll set the course for a brand new move of God. Every marriage should be a new move of God in the earth. Now I present unto you the first time Mr. and Mrs. blank blank. Name isn't important, but for the first time, heaven and nature sing. It's supposed to be so unique, we've never seen this one before. And the two will become one, naked and not ashamed. Glory is on that. You pull glory away, you'll see every flaw. And glory lives when we walk contrary. Thank you, Lord. I say glory will lift off of your house if you're walking contrary. And when the glory lifts, you'll point fingers. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your, you'll see every flaw. When the glory is there, you can be naked and not ashamed. Family isn't a democracy. You can't vote on vision. Well, daddy, we just disagree. Well, there's a hierarchy. Each family should have general structure. In other words, mom and daddy make the decisions, not the children. And when you get your family, you'll thank me for this. You'll reap what you sow. Every time your mama says something, you got a word back, guess what's going to happen to your oldest daughter? And when she's going to be nasty with it, throw her hand up, don't you tell me. <laughs> And for you spiritual parents, you need to know how to lead. As a universal rule, the parents are the ones who judge and decide and give directives and govern. <laughs> Let me say it again. They judge, say they judge, they decide they give directives and they govern. You look them all up and you'll see the role that you need to play. And the children are to follow their instructions. Mothers, if you're a single parent, that's on you. You need to do all of them. You need to be the one that judge the matter. That means you need wisdom. You need the one that decides. You make a decision and you live up to it. And when you make that decision, we're not going to a restaurant today. We're going to go to pub. I don't want Publix. Once you make the decision, you don't change. That's why before you make the decision, you have wisdom. The word decision, to cut, to cut off options. <laughs> Most people don't make decisions because when you make one, there is no other option. You give directives. That means from you, you're the one. We're going to do it this way. I need you to think about that. I need you to no, wait. What is, what is that you're wearing? That's way too short. That's not our family name. We don't do that. And you govern. That means whatever you expect, you inspect. You govern it. And when you do that, the home. We'll have a sense of glory to fall upon it. And it will become the foundation of the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you for this word and I praise you for this time together in the word. And I praise you for what you're doing in us. I thank you for the heart that you've given us. For the mind to comprehend the spirit that contains this word. 
you're raising up leaders, you're structuring families, you're changing and shifting churches, and your people are growing. Have your way in this place and around the world. And God, we will give you glory, honor, and praise for touching the family. In Jesus' name, amen.